Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Business Growth Show, where we talk about all components of business and how to utilize them for exponential growth. My name is Aiden Cassiotis. I'm a serial entrepreneur, international speaker, results strategist, business coach, mentor, and consultant. Today, I have an awesome guest. He is a business growth expert, best selling author, international speaker, and serial entrepreneur. He broke his leg and dropped out of his undergraduate accounting and finance program. His business growth journey started from 18 years old, and now he has built three multi-million dollar businesses before age 40, mentored the launch of over 5,000 businesses, and has trained and certified over 7,000 business coaches in 35 countries. He has written three best-selling books on business strategy and growth named Blueprint for Success, The Seven Stages of Small Business Success, and most recently, Biz Dev Done Right. His clients range from Fortune 500 companies to small to mid-market businesses. And each week, he co-hosts Quit and Get Rich on iHeartRadio. Welcome, Carl Gould, and thank you for being on my show. Hey, Ethan. Thanks so much. That was great. Awesome, mate. You're very welcome. I always love doing an amazing intro and so awesome to have you here today. Uh, You're a very successful entrepreneur. So, you know, for those people who don't know who you are, just please introduce yourself by telling us about you and your journey. Sure. Well, my name is Carl Gould. I live in uh, New Jersey, born and raised in the United States. I, um, I, yeah, I've been in the entrepreneurial world for almost 37 years now. Um, and um, I grew a number of businesses, starting with a contracting company. And, uh, but I went to school for accounting and finance and um, had a really bad uh, leg injury. And, and, you know, that forced me to leave school. And so I needed to make some money. So uh, I, I started with what I knew best, which was a landscaping company, started that business, grew it over the next seven years, sold it, started a construction company, had that business for 12 years, sold that. Um, but I started coaching in 1990 and really found my passion. It, were, it was the sort of thing that I really loved to do. Um, and, over, and all through the 90s, you know, if there was such a thing as a side hustle or, you know, the gig economy, that was me. Um, uh, Coaching was a new industry at the time. Nobody really knew what it was. Uh, You certainly weren't making a full time living at it. And uh, but I I figured out a way to do that. And and that be my method became very popular. And uh, over the years, I certified or trained or accredited uh, over 7000 business coaches worldwide. So, you know, I went from mowing lawns and building houses to uh, coaching and advising small to mid market business business owners all around the world. So I, you know, I I feel really grateful and blessed to, um, you know, to be able to uh, uh, do what I get to do these days. Yeah, love that. Amazing story there and and what you've achieved. And I like to go back a bit towards the start to hear from you because, um, you know, you started your business growth journey at 18 years old, which is early, right? Like most people were just, you know, getting into university at that point, right? So I just want to like know from your perspective, what was it like? Starting at that point, and you know, what did you have to change, I guess, to to move forward from there? Well, you know, when I, when I went to college, I was thinking I went, I was going for accounting and finance, and and I knew I wanted to be involved in business, but not really sure how. I didn't I didn't have like what I thought my profession was going to be, and 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 so I, I you know, it was a tough time for me at the time because when I left school, I mean, I was paying my own way. I, I, I'm one of ten children. I, um, you know, if you wanted something that you, you went out, figured out how to pay for it and you did it and that's how you got it. And so, you know, when I was at home with my leg in a cast, you know, elevated on my mom's couch, I wasn't feeling too great about myself or the world. And so I, it was really a tough time and I was looking for direction and, and I just knew I needed to make money. I mean, I, I didn't start a business at it because it was a passion play. I just started it because, you know, I could have gone back to working at a restaurant and scrubbing pots for, you know, minimum wage at the time was like $3 and 25 cents an hour. Um, The most money I ever made was in construction. You know, I was making, you know, double the minimum wage at the time. And I said, you know, this is, this is decent money. Let me try it. Um, um, And then I realized that very quickly that I could do this on my own. Um, when I was a teenager, still in high school, my boss used to send me out on proposals. I was winning them. As soon as I got done winning them, he would say, okay, well, that's great. Next week you go get to do it. And I was thinking, well, wait a minute. 
So I'm I'm going on the proposal, winning the proposal. Then I'm going to do the work. I'm managing the work. The only thing I didn't do was get the lead. And I figured, you know, if that's the only thing left and I can have the business to myself and make, you know, all the money that he's making, well, you know, that doesn't sound like such a bad gig. So I went out and I started my business and it was, you know, I put the word out to people that I knew, friends and family, got a few jobs, picked up a little momentum. And I started to realize like, wow, this whole business thing isn't so bad because if I can control my costs and I can get out there and hustle, all the extra money is mine, all of it. And I thought, oh, geez, I think I like this better than me making somebody else a whole bunch of money. I mean, I realized today that I wasn't very employable in the first place, but I realized very quickly, the more I hustle, the more I make. And the, I latched on to that as you know something that I felt I was doing really well, which was hustling. And then I learned very quickly how to start to win clients, win customers over my competitors. And so that got very enticing very quickly. And I realized, you know, I'm on to something here, regardless of what I was doing, whether it was landscaping, whether it was building a house, whether it was being a contractor, whether it was any gig at all. I found that the more I was humble and grateful and service driven, uh, but I hustled my ass off, um, I was getting rewarded for it. The more I did it, the more I got. And so I'm like, man, I think I, this, I like this, you know? And so that's what really put me on that path and kept me there. Yeah. I love that amazing story there. And um, I think what's interesting of probably what a lot of people will resonate in you is that not all family and friends are going to be as supportive, right? Because they're probably thinking, oh, just go get a job. Don't do that business thing or something like that. So there's probably some some mindset things that, you know, had to change, um, you know, from, from growing up and other areas there. So I just want to hear from your perspective about mindset and about how important it is and that, how that's helped you as well on your, your business growth journey. Yeah. So I, um, I mean, I think it's been, you know, almost everything because the, you know, the research has shown that the top attribute that all entrepreneurs have successful entrepreneurs have is resilience. You know, the ability to pick yourself back up. I mean, when I started my first business, there was a real estate depression going on at the time. It was the mid to late eighties, you know, um, the interest rates on a mortgage were like 13 to 18%. I mean, it was unbelievable. It was crazy times. And yet I, I started a residential home improvement business during the middle of a res residential real estate recession, and in some cases, depression. And so it was you on paper, it was the worst time to start a business. But, you know, I figured, look, people still need to get work done. No matter how bad it is, I just got to find the ones who need, who need the work done and are willing to do it. Um, and so staying motivated, staying on, staying on top, um, of my game was, you know, was, was one of the things that I had to master the most because what I found out very quickly, like six months, uh, so I'm out of school, right? Um, I broke my leg. I'm in a cast. I'm in a cast for three months, leg elevated in a cast three months, get the cast cut off. And I was, uh, you know, I had no money, nothing to my name. I was going through physical therapy. And I remember getting the use of my leg back enough where I could contemplate really going back to work full time. And now I start to get bills in the mail from all the places that I borrowed money from in order to go to college. Because once you're out of school six months, they want to be paid back. And that's when it hit me. I realized, you know what? No one gives a shit about my problems. They got their own problems. I'm not saying it was, you know, that they don't care about me. But you know what? They loaned me money. The rules said after six months, we get paid back. It doesn't say, well, only if you don't have a bad time, you know, it just six months, you know, you get paid back. And so it, it hit me that, you know, people care, had their own problems. They had their own thing going on. And I had to get my, my acting gear and my act in order because the world is going to keep going on with me or without me. And, and so it was rather humbling experience because I hadn't, I hadn't experienced that level of failure and I hadn't experienced that level of frustration before in my life, thought I was cruising along pretty well. And, and I just realized that no one's coming to save me. That's it. It's time to put my big point pants on and start to embrace the fact that I, you know, if, if I'm going to have a way in this life, I'm going to make that way. Yeah. 
powerful words there. I love that, you know, we're the master of our destiny. And I love how you talk about resilience there. And, you know, in business, there's, you know, so many failures and stuff that happen along the journey, right? And obviously coaches and mentors can help us there. You know, you've worked with so many different businesses, right? And people from all over the world. What are some of the top mistakes that you see entrepreneurs make, you know, especially when they want to start scaling their business that, you know, if you can put that up is maybe we can refrain from that. So we don't have to go down that same path and, you know, grow better and quicker along the journey. Yeah. So, I, I mean, it's a couple of things, you know, people get into businesses for all sorts of reasons and, you know, some by choice and some really not by choice, you know, they've, they've got fired from their job or, and, uh, or, you know, they've risen to a salary level that most businesses don't want to pay anymore. So they become somewhat unemployable, you know? Um, and so, the and I, I'm not one of these guys where you have to be passionate about your work. I do believe you have to e- either love what you do, or how you're doing it, or why you're doing it. Right? I didn't love what I did in the beginning, but I did love how I was doing. I found out that I was. I found a few secret sauces that I learned very early in business that served me well, and I was just smoking the competition. So I, I liked how I was doing business. And the reason why I was in business at the time, it was very selfish, but I needed to make money. I needed to make a living, pay off debt. I mean, I, and so my how and my why were strong, but I can't say I loved what I was doing. I mean, you know, that my construction was not a passion play for me. Um, But the, um, you know, so everyone gets into these things for different reasons. And I think you have to find that reason and be able to latch onto it because that's what's ultimately going to keep you motivated. That's what's ultimately going to serve your mindset. And on the days that it's hard, and believe me, there were days, you know, I had a weather driven business and there were days when it was freezing cold and where it was raining or it was muddy. And I just simply did not feel like doing it that day. Um, But I had to, I had to really push through that. You know, I still do to this day. I mean, Sometimes I just don't feel like it. And on those days, those are the days that make or break you. You On the days that you don't feel like it, when it's tough, those are the times that are going to test you and that you really have to come through. Yeah, I love that. So many powerful words there. And um, if we talk about positioning now, right, where people say that we should set up our business as if we're going to sell it from the start, right? And then, you know, we obviously want to get it to the point where we want to sell if that's, you know, the end goal of the business, whether we do sell it or not. So I'd like to hear it from your point of view, since you've worked with so many of, how do we position, you know, our business for sale? Well, if you're positioning your business for sale, it's it, the business has to be a machine that runs without, you, you know, um, you're building an automobile. Right. And then you're teaching somebody else to drive it. Um, and, and the less that the business relies on you on a day in, day out basis, the more sellable your business is. If somebody looks at your business and says, well, geez, if Ethan leaves half of the biz, uh, half of the clients go with him, well, then the business is worth a lot less than if you were to say, well, if I buy the business and Ethan leaves and all the clients are under contract and it's monthly recurring or annual recurring revenue or, you know, everything's transferable or clients don't even know who he is, then the business is actually more valuable. So putting the processes in place, having the intellectual property, meaning the, 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 the secret sauce that is unique only to you and you've either packaged, promoted or protected it and, and, and you have somebody who generates leads and somebody who creates those leads into sales and somebody who's in charge of fulfilling those orders in place, you have a very sellable asset. Yeah. Love that. Really powerful. And, you know, if we go into that next level now where we've got this sellable asset, right, or we're in this business and we really want to build, you know, sustainable revenue growth and even profit growth, right? It's not always just about revenue. It's about profit of how much we're making, what are some key things that we can do to ensure that we're building our business properly and it's not you know, going to fall apart? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I work with clients on in the very beginning, it's almost 100% across the board, is their pricing strategy. You, you as a business have to optimize and maximize your pricing. In other words, every bit that your clients are willing to pay for your services, you need to charge it. And it's not about being greedy. It's about having enough money and enough margin to pay for mid-level managers, insurance, all the legitimate business expenses that allow you to build a sustainable company that runs on its own and has all of those 
all those aspects in place, you need to have, you know, you need to maximize how much you're charging. You need to be being paid among the top in your industry. And that's what's going to allow you to be sustainable because here's what happens. You start a business, you're doing great, and maybe you have good prices or you discount your pricing. And then you say, you wake up one day and say, you know, it's kind of hard to do this every day. I don't know how much longer I can do this. I need to bring on staff to replace me. Well, you have, so you have to pay um, people that have non-revenue generating positions like a bookkeeper, like an administrator, like a manager, you know, and these people might not be revenue generating and there has to be enough margin to pay for them to allow you to scale. And if you don't have that built into your pricing, it's hard to take your current client base and all of a sudden say, hey, good news. One, I don't feel like working with you anymore. And two, I'm going to charge you double in order to get out. Well, your clients aren't necessarily going to be all all receptive to that because you've trained them at one price point and you have not trained them to pay the premium that you would like to get now. Yeah. So many amazing points there um, on, on pricing and knowing your numbers and everything like that as well, which is so important. So let, let's, let's change the gear slightly and talk about our competition, right? Like, cause we've got to be knowing what's going on in the market. And, you know, a lot of time, People don't necessarily say all the good reviews to people, but they say the negative reviews and things like that. You know, it's sort of uh, yeah. the way society is. But how can we capitalize on that? So if we're looking at like complaints and stuff, of what's happening with our competitors and think what issues people are having, how can we, you know, capitalize on that into our business planning and, and how our business runs? So, so there's two ways to look at it. So the first way to look at it is if you get a negative complaint on your business or a negative review, um, first off, nobody's expecting you to be perfect. So if you get a negative review, how you deal with that negative review is equally as powerful as getting a positive one sometimes. So if you do the right thing by that person and explain, say, hey, we screwed up and here's how I want to make it right to you. Handling those negative reviews are very, very powerful. And if all you had were a thousand glowing reviews and no negatives, that would actually reduce the credibility of the positive ones in the first place. So getting a negative review is not the worst thing in the world. Now, if you're looking for a differentiator in your business, utilizing negative reviews of your competitors and of the industry is what I've learned is one of the most powerful things you can do in your business. In other words, you go out and find out what are the top five complaints that people have about your industry. Maybe not about you, but certainly about your industry. You take those five complaints and you create a you create a product or a service or a level of a level a, a level of your programming that you say to them i guarantee that those five things will never happen to you or i'll give you all your money back and you take the top five complaints these are the things that are on top of mind of your your industry prospects that is one of the quickest ways to differentiate yourself i mean if you think about netflix and what they did to blockbuster they took the top things that people didn't like about Blockbuster, said, all we ask is that you put your, you know, your credit card on file and you're willing to walk back and forth to your mailbox. And if any of these top things, these five things happen to you um, with us, I'll give you all your money back. That was so powerful. That took two guys in a garage out, you know, took down the 800 pound gorilla in the marketplace and changed the marketplace. That's how powerful that is. So if you can figure out what people complain about and you could take away that pain, um, people are willing not only to pay, but they're willing to overpay and pay your premium for that. Yeah, I love that. So powerful. Let's let's talk about people from, yeah, I think the early stages of business are the hardest, right? When you're getting off the ground, once you sort of got momentum, it, it becomes a lot easier. So, you know, many entrepreneurs when they're starting or at early stage of their business, doing everything or a lot of things themselves, right? And they probably think yeah. some of them are like, no one else can do the task better than me and, and things like that, you know? And maybe they've got someone in there and they're only doing 80% as well and stuff like that. And that is an issue for them. So why is it important for entrepreneurs to relinquish control, you know, so that as they're, you know, they're growing their business so they can scale? Well, it's a great question because business owner, uh, the way it, for a business to scale, but to take a step back, growing and scaling are two totally different things. When a business owner gets started, they are growing, 
right? They're growing their business. They're getting busier. They're getting more clients, more customers. But they're, they're, when I say growing, growing implies that the business owner is still tied to the business and has to be involved in a day in, day out basis. Scaling implies that the business owner is not involved in all the day to day operations because there's too many clients to service, too, too many employees to manage, and that business owner can no longer have their hand in everything. And so you have to communicate to your clients and you have to communicate to your employees through A, other people, and B, through processes. And that processes could include like software or automation. So it's so important that a business owner give up control and transfer that control to other people who are aligned on their mission, vision, values, and purpose, and also processes that create, create predictable and consistent results over time. Now you've got a scalable, you've got a scalable operation. And the only way you can scale is if a business owner is willing to give up control. Business owner not willing to give up control can't scale. Yeah. So powerful there. And the mindset shift that needs to happen to, to relinquish control. And let's talk about, you know, we, a lot of people talk about all the good times in business, but there's also a lot of down times, right? Business is sort of like an up and down roller coaster from time to time. Um, so we all have down times, you know, maybe people call it the winter or something of the business. So I'd like to know how you define this and, and how do we survive you know, the downtimes, you know, whether it's competition, it's market or whatever like that. I got to tell you, I love the downtimes. Um, the downtimes to me are the times that separate the men from the boys, the weak from the strong, and those that have done their homework and those that have prepared. I started my, like you're talking to the wrong guy. I started in 1985 in the middle of a real estate recession. I went through 1987 you know, the Black Friday, I went through 9-11, I went through 2008, and now we're going through a pandemic. And what I find over and over again, is those people that are prepared, that have done their homework, that are hustling, that are doing everything in their power and fully committed to serving their clients, they're going to continue to do well during the tough times. It's the people that aren't really prepared, or are doing what's convenient and aren't really committed. Those are the people that are going to struggle. So I don't mind the tough times in that they, it, 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 it you know, thins out those that are doing, do, doing business for convenience, you know, like that shop owner. I remember asking a shop owner, I'm like, who's your client? Like whoever walks by, I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? You know, well, I turned the sign from closed to open and people walk in. I'm like, that's not an avatar, you know, and, and look. Over this past year, I feel for restaurants. I, I love the industry. I've always loved the industry, but they got complacent. You know, when times were good, my restaurant, my favorite restaurant was not calling me saying, hey, Carl, you know, you've mentioned so many times how much you love this sauce that we make or this particular plate. You know, what days of the week would you like us to make and deliver it to you? That's a call I never got. Through the pandemic, I never, ever, got a phone call from any of the restaurants that I would go to on a regular basis. And I eat out all the time and I'm vegan, right? So it's, it's hard to find like the meal you want the way you want it. But I used to go to once, once a restaurant got my meal, right. I used to go all the time. I used to order takeout all the time. You know how many called me during the pandemic to see what they could do for me? Zero, none, none. Right. So, you know, now there's now they're complaining, oh, you know, it's so hard. Uh, I'm like, dude, where were you? You are to blame 100 percent. I have empathy for you and I'm sorry. And I wouldn't wish this on anybody. But don't sit here and tell me that you're a victim. You were asleep at the switch. You know, and so I have that. I have a, 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 a monstrosity of a problem around. You know, and so look, during tough times, we're going to find out just how committed are you? Yeah, you know, definitely. So true. And, you know, uh, another saying that I've heard as well is that you need to have reasons or you can have results, right? Do you want to have a reason where you're blaming other things outside of you or do you want to take control of your destiny and, and create results at the same time? Um, it's not easy and it's not fair. I'm not trying to make it sound like I'm better than anybody or anyone else is better than anyone else. It's not even about that. But business, business is one of the most rewarding endeavors ever. 
but it is among the most unfair of all because you are unfairly punished when you don't follow the rules and you don't stay committed and you don't market your business consistently. You are unfairly punished for that. And conversely, you are unfairly rewarded when you remain consistent and predictable. And, and again, it's I feel for somebody who struggles, but the rules are really well defined and it's been out there forever and it hasn't changed ever. You know, people ask me, uh, Ethan, they'll say, they'll say to me, well, Carl, like, when does it get easy? Like, I've been in business for a decade, 15 years, 20 years. Like, when does, when does my reputation kick in and, you know, people just start coming to me? And I'm like, you're not going to like the answer. The answer is never. It doesn't ever get easy. You have to earn it every single time. And if you're not up for it, the market will swallow you whole. They just will. They'll tell, you know, look at BlackBerry. BlackBerry, I know it's getting to be an old story, but they were the phone, the phone. When, you know, when does it get easy for us? It doesn't because you know what? <clears throat> There's another phone company around the corner that just developed apps. And if you don't get on, you don't get your ass in gear and start developing apps, you're going to get left behind. Oh, no. Come on. Oh, come on. Yeah. Oh, come on. Where are they? They're gone. They're gone. The marketplace doesn't care about your problems. Yeah. So amazing points there. And let's talk about assumptions now, Carl, because I'm sure a lot of people, you know, make assumptions about us for a variety of different reasons. Even like pricing, you know, which you've mentioned is, you know, when we have prospects and, you know, price can be linked to quality and value, right? Um, yeah. Out there. So um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about, you know, the assumptions of our prospects, our buyers, um, and, you know, whether it's around pricing, quality, and value or other assumptions about, you know, what, what are the important things we need to take into consideration to ensure that we get, you know, the best results in our business? Well, as it relates to pricing, you know, if you, if you were to ask just about anybody, like, you know, what's a better watch, a, a Rolex or a Casio? You know, most people would automatically say Rolex, you know, and um, and, you know, what's the difference between the two at the end of the day? And you and it, you'd be hard pressed. I, I read this great article about how why watches are expensive. And and um, and, you know, they say that the materials that go into a watch are pretty similar, you know, and they said, well, the handcrafted ones tend to be more expensive. The ones that are more automated in their construction tend to be you know, um, less expensive. And I thought, well, now, isn't that interesting? So if I get less efficient, I take a lot longer to fulfill the order. And, and I use really old and archaic methods. I'll be worth a lot more, you know, because essentially that's the, what, what the watch business has done. And they'll say, but they, they message it better. Oh, it's handcrafted. It's artisan. It's master crafted. I'm like, Sounds like slow and inefficient to me, but okay, I get it, right? You know, uh, but they've done a tremendous job of messaging themselves and 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 creating the branding. So they have, you know, you, you have to really understand who your customer is and you have to sell directly to what those desires are because the person who spends 10 grand, 15 grand on a Rolex, they think that's a good deal. The person who spends $100 on a Casio says, what are you Rolex people thinking? You're crazy. I could buy 15 of these things. And they think they've made the right deal. Well, you know what? They're both right. Because they're totally different segments of the market. Rolex isn't better than Casio. And Casio is not better than Rolex. To their clients, they're perfect. And they've each done a really good job of, of preaching the values and the lifestyle to that clientele. And it's the companies that are not aligned with their clientele or don't really understand their clientele, um, you know, and the experience has gotten stale. Those are the ones that are suffering. You know, right now they talk about retail. Like, why is retail suffering? Well, they say, well, Amazon and online shopping. I'm like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. There's plenty of retail outlets that are doing really well because the client experience is very good. What online shopping did was they made part of the shopping experience, a commodity. And retail has to up their game to the next generation of client experience. And if they do that, they'll be busy. And if they don't do that, they're going to get slaughtered. Yeah. So many amazing points there. I love that. And, you know, I think value is a big thing in business, right? We've got to be providing value to our clients, right? The people that we help. And 
you know, how can we provide more and more value where possible, right? So that people want to stay with us. Maybe we can increase our prices, all of these other things. Now, there's a different way of looking at value as well that we can, you know, cut costs or do other things, right? Which um, makes it happen there. So I'd like to hear um, your take on different ways of how to get higher value, whether it's cutting costs or other ways to provide to our clients as well. So, um, I mean, well, so there's a number of things in there. I mean, if you, if you, um, and what we should all do is we should all look at expense reduction exercises in order to get more lean so that we can in turn either pass along the savings to the client or get more competitive or be able to put more features into your product or service. There's no question about that. Um, what I've seen, especially recently, is the growing opportunity to outsource. And um, I would be looking at that big time. As a matter of fact, we, we say to our clients that you should staff to the valleys and subcontract to the peaks. In other words, keep your fixed costs as low as possible and build a, an army of, of uh, subcontractors and other agents and other businesses and strategic alliance partners so that when you get busy, you can manage the peaks without taking on a lot of fixed overheads. You know, you're, you want, there, one of the skills you need as a business owner is your ability to uh, expand the business to meet demand. 100%, totally get it. But also, you have to be able to contract or shrink your business during off-peak times. Because what people learned in the pandemic is they not only lost the profit during the pandemic, but they had to eat into their profits from the last year and into their savings to cover it. So the pandemic just didn't impact one year, it impacted two years, right? And so we, we need to, and, and a lot of times companies were just not quick enough or agile enough to be able to contract their business during slower times. And so they really, they really have to learn that skill and be able to be agile enough to move to to you know, morph their business to the size that's appropriate given the conditions they're in. Yeah, love that. Powerful points there. And you know, as us as the business owner, as we're growing and scaling our business, you know, leadership becomes much more important, right? Um, to be able to lead people and and help people going along the journey, along with our you know purpose, mission, values, vision, and all of that. So, can you share your thoughts on leadership and how we can become better leaders? Well, how you could become a, well, my thoughts on leadership are, you know, there's, there's been no greater need for leadership right now. And the, and the more we're in volatile times or uncertain times, the more leadership is valued uh, because people follow certainty. People believe in, in those that project certainty. And so your ability to remain consistent and remain constant and be that port in the storm during times of uncertainty will be the hallmark of you as a leader. Now, how do you improve your leadership? Well, there's so many ways to do that. Um, you can lead from the front, you can lead from the middle, you can lead from the, you can lead from the back. But there, for, to become a big, bigger leader, uh, to be, I'm sorry, a better leader, you know, you almost, almost have to adopt a ready, fire, aim mentality. Maybe not strategy, but mentality. In other words, when uh, when it's when the when the situation calls for you to step up, just step up, even if you don't know what to do, and and then respond to what the environment and the scenario is calling for. Don't make it more than it is. Don't make it less than it is. Evaluate it for what it is, and trust in your own internal resources that you will rise to the occasion and do what is in the best interest of yourself, others, and the greater good, you know? So, but it starts with a commitment to say, I believe in myself, I believe in my abilities. And, uh, you know, given, given what I've done in my life so far, I mean, when you think about it, we are, everyone who's listening right now, we are a hundred percent. We have a hundred percent success rate in dealing with the difficulties in our life. We've made it through every day of our lives. Not one of them killed us. We're here. We made it. Right. And so, you know, it doesn't mean we're perfect. It doesn't mean, you know, but at the same time, we are whatever 90 for 90, however many difficult situations you went through in your life, 
you made through, you made it through all of them. You're here today. So you have an impeccable track record as a leader already. You may not define yourself that way. You might not think of yourself way, that way, but you are. And so taking that as a reference point and saying, wait a minute, I've gotten through everything. Here I am today. No matter how, what I think of today, I've gotten through. So if we could take that and say, that's my building block. I'm a survivor. I get through things. I make things happen. I know how to get through, you know, and, and that could be the basis of your leaders, your continued leadership journey. So many ways to get there. So many books, so many tapes, so many videos, so many TED Talks, you name it on the subject. You can pick your path to how you develop, but just recognizing that you already are a leader and you've been that in throughout your career and your life so far, now you're just building on what, what is already there. Yeah, very powerful words. I trust everybody was uh, following that and, and embody that, right, as a leader. That's uh, amazing words there. And um, coaching and mentoring, right? Like you've been in this industry for a while now. Um, you know, you're a coach and mentor. I am. We, um, you know, we have coaches and mentors. I'd like to hear from your perspective how important has coaching mentoring been for you specifically in your business and, and what it's helped for you to achieve? Well, I, you know, I think coaching and mentoring has made me, you know, probably one of the largest impacts I've had in my life. I mean, when um, I valued, you know, I played a lot of sports when I was a kid and I really valued um, my sports coaches. You know, they gave me insights about myself. They gave me insights about the game I was playing. And as I learned, you know, the game was just the microcosm of life. You know, it, 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 it you know, the sports that I played, you know, prepared me well for the life that I had later, later on, because, you know, sports taught me creative problem solving and teamwork and influence and teaching others and learning that you can't get there by yourself. So many good life lessons. When I got into business um, and when I was struggling the most, I hired a business mentor who worked with me for five years. And I realized, my God, there's, you know, the, this, this, there's a whole skill here. And I learned that, you know, having somebody look down or look across at what's going on, I can't see the whole picture. I, and, and, a, and a coach has helped me do two main things. One is understand where my blind spots were. And two, they're a time machine. You know, they've, they took all of their lessons and I was the recipient of that. So I didn't have to make all those mistakes. What took that person 20 or 30 years to learn? I got, I got one download in one session and they gave me all that experience. And I, and I also learned that, you know, mentors come in various forms um, and mentors and coaches are good for segments of your life. They don't have to be there forever and they don't have to be there for every aspect of your life. They could be there for just parts of your life. But if you can find the nugget in all the people around you, virtually everyone that you come into contact at any given day has something of value to offer you from a coaching or a mentoring or a training perspective. Um, you know, that if you, you, you know, the signs are all there. If you can read those signs and you can pull the lesson out of them and, uh, and you, can, you can really learn to assimilate that into your life, I, I think coaching and mentoring is one of the, biggest accelerants you can have in your life. It certainly was for me. Yeah, I love that. I completely agree with you. It's definitely changed my life. And I, you know, like you, I'm sure enjoy giving back and, and helping others, right? Um, along our journey to help them to, to grow um, much quicker as well. So very powerful points there. And um, as we're, we're wrapping up here, Carl, I guess, what one key piece of advice would you give to all of the entrepreneurs, you know, watching and listening today? Well, as, as an entrepreneur, one of the things that I've learned um, and coaching now, I've, I've, we've coached over 100,000 entrepreneurs. And, you know, what, I, what I've learned is that over time, you're, gonna, you're going to be faced with a lot of, it, of, a lot of adversity. And, you know, that adversity is molding your character. And that adversity typically comes just a few inches before the finish line. And adversity is a, is, a, is a funny competitor and a funny adversary at times because if you, we, think, we think we are far away from the end result, but really it's just the door, the last door we have to open before getting through to the result. 
you know, if I walk across this room and I want to get out, the last thing that I have to manage before walking out is the door itself. And it's got a lock on it and it's got a doorknob and it's got a chain on it. You know, it could seem like the most formidable opponent, but it's really the gateway for the next thing for you to happen. And so I, I have watched so many entrepreneurs quit right before the finish line or sabotage their results right before the finish line when things got a little tough. And really that toughness is the last thing you have to deal with before the breakthrough. And it's going to make the next phase of your life and your experience that much stronger. So always push through. Yeah, I love it. Completely agree. So powerful there. Um, you know, we connected through our networks where I learned about your awesome journey from starting at 18 years old to now building, you know, three multi-million dollar businesses before age 40 and, you know, mentored the launch of over 5,000 businesses and trained and over certified over 7,000 business coaches in 35 countries. That's that's a massive feat. You know, you're a, you're an awesome guy, Carl. Uh, and, you know, I'm sure that you will continue to make a massive impact in the world, you know, through business and, and everybody that you're helping through all the various channels. So I'm very grateful that we connected and I look forward to working with you in the future as well. So how can people find you and get in contact with you? Well, thank you. That's very, very, very kind. Um, well, carlgould.com is one of the quickest ways to find me. Um, uh, and we offer a complimentary growth session. That's our give back to the entrepreneurial community. So any of your listeners, if you want to take us up on it, come on carlgould.com in the contact us. Uh, just put business analysis in the subject line and we'll make sure that we get you hooked up with one of our growth advisors and we'll show you five ways to grow your business and uh, with our compliments. So hopefully our, our paths will cross again. Love that. Definitely check out Carl, guys. You can see that he's a, a man that has so much knowledge and has done so many, helped so many people around the world as well. So thank you everyone for watching, listening to this show where we talk about everything on business growth. Please like, subscribe, and leave us a five-star review. You can find me on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and YouTube as Ethan Cassiotis. So visit my website, ethancassiotis.com. I completely agree with you, or do I? The only way we know is if you tune in next time. So until next time, remember that our business grows when we learn skills and take action using them in spite of fear. So design your growth and results. Have a great day.